Okay, well, thanks for uh, um, well having me here, and uh, and thanks for uh, organizing this. Um, so we had these uh, two uh, wonderful introductions for uh, the stories that the story that I'm going to tell, um, which is how to get novelty and uh, in uh, evolutionary models. So how to understand um, innovation in evolution. And, uh, and what I'm going to say is, and what I'm going to propose is that um, having these kinds of um, multi-scale models, uh, like the ones that uh, Silvia de Monte proposed and that Renske also showed, is uh, the ideal setup for modeling evolutionary innovation. And so, uh, and so, well, I, I can basically skip my introduction. Um, and uh, so, well, in general, typically evolutionary models work by assuming that some features are adaptive and then uh, trying to find conditions of when they, they can evolve. So through a fitness landscape or maybe through a cost benefit kind of uh, um, function. And, um, and so these kind of models are very useful to understand, of course, very useful to understand how evolution works, but they don't show uh, uh, true novelty, innovation, like uh, what we see evolution doing for the past you know, 4 billion years. And, um, and so I would like to show you some models where, um, uh, where uh, uh, well, there are some interacting individuals, uh, some microscopic replicators, and through their interactions, some em emergent level of individuality uh, appears. And uh, this emergent level of individuality is the ideal context in which new functions arise. Of course, this is, from a biological viewpoint, uh, um, uh, nothing particularly shocking. So from uh, the, the, so we heard about the evolutionary transition from single cell to multicellular organization or that of, uh, um, well, groups of microbes that become a uh, um, holobiont. And of course, this has also happened at the origin of life when a bunch of um, presumably uh, RNA replicators um, self-organized and evolve to form the original uh, uh, cell. And so what I want to show here is a simple model of uh, this RNA world where um, where uh, RNA molecules have to replicate one another, which immediately opens the problem of uh, uh, the, 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 well, the evolutionary problem of cooperation. Nobody wants to replicate another molecule. Everybody wants to be replicated by other molecules. And so, um, and so, um, in this in this kind of RNA world, we expect uh, parasites and uh, and selfish uh, genetic elements. To, um, to arise. And so the version of this RNA world that I'm going to show um, you now is, uh, uh, well, pastes these interactions on a two-dimensional grid. And so uh, there are replicators, uh, the replicators replicate one another. And I'm also assuming that there are parasites, which are specialized templates that uh, get replicated at very high rate, but do not replicate anybody. And so what you see here is uh, after evolution. Uh, in, and, and so uh, well, in black, this is just the empty space. Green are replicators. And, uh, and you see that these RNA replicators invade empty space. And in white, you see, you, I hope you can see parasites uh, that eat up wherever the replicators are. And the other thing that you can see is that these replicators after evolution have evolved to the maximum allowed, maximum possible replication rate in the model. So this is the other way around, right? So we expect selection for, uh, for, for selfishness and we get instead strong selection for replication. And so I'm making um, maybe a more visible uh, case uh, example here where you can see once again replicators uh, orange ones are those that replicate faster, and they are going to invade empty space faster uh, than the red ones, which are assumed to be slowly uh, replicating. And in the back of this wave of replicators, there are parasites, and parasites, well, they're better templates than everybody else, so they will invade everywhere there are replicators, and behind, they leave empty space for new replicators 
to uh, invade. And so, uh, and so in the context of these uh, waves, uh, of these um, wavy patterns, parasites uh, force replicators out of steady state. And, uh, and so although everywhere they win, so there is local selection for parasites, uh, at, the, at this mesoscale level, uh, parasites have an emergent function that uh, the, emerge, the function is to enable the invasion of, uh, of uh, uh, replicators. Okay, so this was an RNA world model, uh, but of course this was a very clear kind of cooperation problem. And so uh, translating this to a microbial um, public good model is straightforward. Replicators uh, now are microbes and they replicate uh, by, well, they secrete some public good and evolve upon amount of public good. So they, um, and they replicate uh, with a fitness that is proportional to the amount of public good they get. And of course there is a cost. Uh, the more public good is produced by a microbe, the more it pays a certain cost. And so when we let the model run, we get that uh, uh, for low costs, the amount of public good production, so cooperation, becomes very high. And so low costs, cooperation. When we increase the costs, instead we see that the amount of public good, so cooperation, drops. So this is high costs, cheating. This is expected from every classical literature on group selection. And then we increase costs even more. And, uh, and we get that uh, 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 cooperation increases again. And, and together with that, we always have a lineage of uh, uh, cheaters, of selfish individuals that don't produce public good. So when we look at what is going on in the field, we see that uh, once again, we have these waves in green, the cooperators, and in blue, the uh, guys that don't produce any uh, public good, so the, the cheaters. And so we start with this idea that selfishness should be selected. Indeed, at a local scale, it is selected. But at the meso scale, the scale of these waves, we, get, we see that it is actually beneficial uh, for cooperation. And also, of course, the fact that uh, there, there is also, well, the fact that when we look at waves, uh, we see that waves are born from waves, uh, occasionally with some variation, uh, inherited variation, and there is a differential survival between waves with different compositions. And so these spatial patterns are themselves an emergent level of uh, biological evolution. A, uh, and so we, we see here an example of uh, uh, what uh, De Monte showed of, um, and nested Darwinian populations. Okay, so next step, one thing I ignored in my RNA model before was that um, RNAs should have a, sequ a, a sequence and a secondary structure. So we introduce this genotype to phenotype map sequence to secondary structure in the model and we let RNAs replicate other RNAs when they fold into a correct arbitrary secondary structure. So when we look at high mutation rates, uh, we would expect from theory and from intuition a broad range of, of sequences, high variability, and instead we see the opposite. We see a narrow distribution of sequence and at the center a kind of uh, germline uh, sequence. And it turns out that this germline is, uh, uh, coordinates a division of labor that happens through mutations. So the sequence, the, the mutants of the sequence behave like soma in the sense that they are uh, terminally differentiated, so they cannot be replicated further, and they have all kinds of novel functions that we did not build in the model, and they happen just through um, evolving the genotype to phenotype map itself. And, uh, and so these uh, new functions might be something like helpers uh, that help the master the replication of the master sequence, or uh, others that inhibit competitors. And so, um, and so, well, the ingredients of the model are, uh, well, local growth, competition, high mutation rates, and an evolvable genotype, phenotype map. And when we go look in, in the microbial world, we find that streptomyces uh, are uh, fit uh, these criteria perfectly. And um, uh, they, are, they are soil bacteria, they compete through antibiotics, they, are, uh, they have a very unstable genome. And it was found very recently in the lab of Danny Rosen that they have a reproductive division of labor between germline, so spore producing, and the antibiotic producing uh, bacteria that is orchestrated through mutations. The germline are, are the individuals that are replicated faithfully. The soma are those that, uh, um, that uh, because of the genomic instability, 
uh, break down large part and delete mostly large part of their genome, and so show that uh, and, and and produce from that a large amount of antibiotics. And so, well, uh, in collaboration with uh, Danny Rosen, um, we made a model of this, and uh, well, and we managed to reproduce. Uh, I'll maybe skip this. Uh, we managed to reproduce a lot of the features of these um, of this uh, mutational division of labor, and. Uh, um, well, um, and so the conclusion here is that uh, um, maybe the, uh, this genome structure that we observe in streptomyces that supports this mutational division of labor uh, could have been expected. So our RNA world model predicts many features of the behavior of streptomyces. And more in general, um, these models are all specified at a microscopic level. So there are individual uh, microscopic replicators, RNA, microbes, uh, cells in the model of uh, Renskes. And uh, through local interactions, they self-organize self into a higher unit. So waves, colonies, or multicellular blobs. And, uh, and these higher levels are new contexts in which microscopic roles acquire new meanings. So new functions that then are picked up by evolution and we see this because as these functions emerge, the evolutionary course of these microscopic replicators is changed. And with this, I conclude. I just would like to thank uh, all my collaborators, uh, in particular, Renske, with whom I uh, talk a lot, and Pauline Hocheweg, uh, because half of the models that I showed here are uh, invented by her, and the other half are inspired by her work. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>